Hare Krishna Shamantru. Welcome back to the Monks Podcast. Hare Krishna. Thank you for having me. Wonderful to discuss as usual some contemporary and deep topics. So I believe you had suggested that we could today discuss something about bhakti spirituality or bhakti wisdom for the contemporary mind. Yes. Mm. So it's so one metaphor I had. Maybe you can build on it, but. Uh, Maybe we could think about this in terms of understanding the characteristics of the contemporary mind, and then how they perceive bhakti spirituality, and then are the spirituality in general, uh, religion and spirituality in general, and then we can talk about how bhakti spirituality's features can be uh, highlighted and presented in a way that can relate with them. So broadly, you could have three features, but one metaphor. You're okay with this three three part structure broadly. Mm. So. Yes. Mm, yeah. So one metaphor I have thought of is that that actually, in one sense, every generation has its own language. So just like if I speak to in English to someone who doesn't who knows only say Marathi, they just can't understand. So similarly, now we may be speaking English today, and 1920s people might be speaking English. and shakespeare might be writing in english but the english itself has changed as a language has changed so just as language can change the whole a significant part of a person's way of thinking way of looking at the world the way of conceiving one's own identity and function in the world all that changes and we could broadly use the met, use language just as we can consider if a person here the world is here language is one way a person interacts with the world so similarly we could say the ethos the world view the de- defining uh, set of ideas that people have they change from generation to generation and that's why unless we present in the language that the people can understand we just lose people so that's why understanding the contemporary mind doesn't mean we are pandering to whatever we could say whatever ideas they presently have but it is like we are trying to understand the language that the contemporary mind understands very true so that was my idea also that for example this one group called the millennials it could be coined by psychologists then used by marketers so millennials use this kind of attire they talk this kind of language what concerns us is religion for this particular group it basically means an institution and in truth it may not be like that mm. but but for say those who are born between the years 1981 and 1996 and they could be anything say 40 years or say 25 years so today those who are between the age of 25 to 40 for them if you say that uh, my religion uh, protects me from the influence of other religions that could be wrong language in one sense for them at least because for them now i would like to keep this for inspection in front of you how much is it true that religion means just accepting a way of life which comes with a prescription which where you conform to certain rites rituals uh and you are supposed to ask a particular set of questions and the set of answers are already ready there yeah you know there is a caricature of traditional religion done by athe- atheists and they say that religion means pay pray and obey oh okay <laughs> pay pray and obey you your you your donation when you go to the temple then you uh go go and offer some prayers and obey whatever are the commandments whatever are the instructions so <laughs> that is to some extent that is how religion has been practiced at i mean in many, many parts of the world and to some extent even in i would say no tradition is exempt to that 
but i tried to present that in a, if we consider the vedic spirituality it is brahma jigyasa so it's inquire so it's inquire mm. analyze and then realize so vimrishaita dashi shena krishna says deliberate deliberate so analyze so inquire analyze and realize but this is not the normal conception of religion that people have Any thoughts on this i have this mental model in uh, which i use like say would i use a a map of mumbai or new york or detroit in order to find something like today's terms would i use a gps system to find something or if i have time at my disposal would i just say that okay i have my lunch early morning 7:30 i take something and i am with a small backpack without any map i'm just roaming around the city and trying to find out what comes my way oh i saw a museum oh you never knew that in 17th street there is a museum no i just went on from first street to second to third and fourth and then i was so happy to discover a museum on the 17th street so okay. so religion means tomorrow you are going to a museum this is the address this is the uber they will pick you up at 7:45 in the morning the museum opens at 8 o'clock so be there because there's a big rush so you avoid so many other hassles and then you get a good tour of the museum and then you come back and spirituality could be you just don't want to have the map but you want to find the joy of discovering it now there could be a chance that you discover the museum on a day when it is open or whatever but there could also be a chance that the day you choose to go to that museum it could be closed and then you say okay well i didn't have any structured plan in my mind anyway so i'm happy that i didn't get it but i got to see the zoo so there is a a structure versus the joy of exploration now those who as i said the first instance you want to do something you want to use minimal time so then you have to follow a certain procedure when you have all the time and doing that is uh like finding out something is not exactly your goal but you like to have a walk so you walk for one and a half hours and that was good for the body so i hope you are getting what i'm saying so can these two be joined can there be like we say prabhupad gave us krishna consciousness we call bhakti wisdom with spirituality prabhupad gave it a name and he also put that name in the name of the movement but in the accounts of people who joined say from 1966 67 onwards where the swami ji was always available the discussion was not just atma soul parmatma super soul it was about village life it was about emotions he would tell stories of his life for example many things in the biography of swami prabhupad would not have been revealed unless he has chosen he had chosen to reveal them so mm. so how do we so okay let me now i got the crux of the thing how do we satisfy the urge of someone between the ages of 18 and 40 today that your urge for discovery for exploration can also be satisfied and this metaphor is beautiful of uh, in the spiritual path we often talk about sadhana and sadhya as a destination mm-hmm. there is a path and uh, one of the characteristics of spirituality as contrasted with religion as the words are understood in today's world world is that spirituality is characterized by you could say ambiguity openness as you said and religion is called calm is characterized by closeness rigidity so the, i think that we have all the answers you just have to you just have to accept the answers and live with them that idea 
so my understanding would be that both sides on the side of religion sometimes there is a over confidence and over simplification of complex issues so just like the what i mentioned about pray pay obey that you know, spiritual growth is cannot be reduced down to uh, such simple uh, such uh, i don't want to use the word simple in the name such a it cannot be reduced down to a list of bullet points to be ticked so on the side of religion and actually when we live religion when we analyze the philosophy that has been given by the religious traditions and we consider the lives of people so the real life is much more complex so on one side there is a over confidence among the religious people that we know everything we know everything this is the path this is the destination and there is over simplification of complex issues there could be ethical issues there could be philosophical issues there could be practical issues so just like in our movement we may say that whatever is the problem chant hari krishna and be happy but is that a solution say when somebody is having a serious sickness and needs treatment and the treatment is not available and some arrangement has to be made to get the treatment so so on one side what happens is that the you say this is the path this is the destination people may feel are you so sure does it work that simply and the nuance and the complexity of real life may be overlooked and also people may find that those who claim to have all the answers they are not really all that great people as human beings i may feel that you know he's not such a wonderful person that i want to become like such a person so in one sense the destination doesn't seem as attractive if this is the ultimate perfection of life maybe i don't i don't want to go to the museum if this is what people who are in the museum people who are in the kingdom of god or people who are going toward the kingdom of god look like this is how they act like so that is one one side of this point of the whole issue i would i can speak the other side also but is there something you would like to respond to this right now no you're doing fine you can get okay. to the the point also. so the other side is that Uh, one of the challenges with spirituality is seen as only openness i think it is said that gk chesterton said that you know uh, minds are like mouths they need to open to take in something but then after taking in they have to close very good <laughs> so so it's good to be open minded no doubt about it but what after that unless uh, we we choose some path so i like the metaphor of a mountain that okay you can explore from the bottom of the mountain okay i like the scenery over here i like the scenery maybe this path looks better that path looks not so difficult not so easy but ultimately one has to climb up the mountain so if we want to really become spiritual then we have to climb up the path to get to the mountain so the religious traditions may say that okay this is the path and that peak of the mountain is the destination so take this path and get to the destination but somebody else may say do i even want to go to the top does this path even take you to the top is the top really the best thing so that selling of selling i'm using here in a commercial sense that selling of both the desirability of the destination and the feasibility or the workability of the path to the destination if that is not done adequately then somebody may say oh, why do you want to go to the peak i just i'm happy wandering around over here there's so much more to see over here and somebody may say okay i've seen so many people they're saying they're going along the going up the path but they are not really going up and that some people are become very sectarian and they exhibit one upsmanship is a one upsmanship and they claim to be following one particular path but all that they are doing is just demeaning other paths demonizing other paths and sometimes literally pulling other people down from their paths so that can put off people also so that's how this now if we actually understand explain that yes this is a path but along this path you can see beautiful sights and at the top of the mountain you can see the most beautiful sight of all you can have exquisite visions from there then the desirability of the destination and the feasibility of the path 
if that is presented properly then people can become attracted you know when prabhupad was asked you know how did you attract so many people prabhupad's answer was disarmingly simple he said krishna is all attractive and he just presented him and he attracted everyone so in one sense prabhupad presented the desirability of the destination and he made the path also seem adventure or he presented the path in a way that it was adventurous challenging enjoyable Okay. Can I move further to the? Yes, please, please, please go ahead. Like, connected, connected with the same thing. So, it may or may not be true, but religion seems to think like, oh, I know what questions you have. I have put all of them in this manual. You just read it, and if you don't get convinced, it's your fault. And the spirituality, the definition among this particular group. is what if i have a question which is not asked by anyone else before i feel i am unique i feel i am special not that i need special privileges but i feel that this question could not be anybody else's question this is my question oh when you say my question is what exactly are you trying to say by that that means this question has not been asked in any manual therefore there is no answer for that and just because i am asking a question which was not asked before you are just shutting me out of the club you are saying no membership for you because you are asking you are asking too many questions yes that's true you know when i was on my spotter a little spiritual search i did one of the things that struck me about prabhupad's books was there are so many question answers in the books and sensible answers sometimes stunningly brilliant answers so but otherwise there is a lot of uh, feel good uh, wishy washy kind of platitude in this kind of statements so yes uh, prabhupad did entertain a large number of questions very open mindedly and he did answer them also so uh, the, that ethos of as you said uh, in the rigveda there is even a question that is raised you know so is there ult- is there a d- ultimate god or is there none who knows So some people use it to say that the Rig Veda is, is actually not even a theistic book. And that's clearly not true. It is theistic. But the okay. fact is that that questions are not that even that kind of inquiry about even the existence of ultimate deity is or uh, uh, is raised in a book that is considered to be one of the foundational religious texts. So yes, often the traditions are more open than what. Uh, Uh, the the root texts of our tradition are often far more open than what some of the current practitioners or cu- some of the current perceptions of that tradition and those texts may be just to give a balanced approach to this thing of what if i have a question which nobody has asked before many political leaders many business leaders when they write their autobiography they have revealed that there were chances or there were events which disappointed them so much they contemplated suicide so if somebody from this age group asks that okay you have this krishna conscious uh, conception of god does your god have suicidal thoughts so one of our leaders he said i'm very happy to worship a god who doesn't have this kind of mental issues <laughs> so i don't know it's okay i was just thinking what space uh, this person is coming from to ask such a question hmm could be because of the conditioning that many of the i'm not saying of all but many of the leaders of society in the fields of trade commerce business sports politics they reveal themselves to be as they say in english deities with clay feet the deity is made of gold but the feet are made of clay and because there is a big robe those clay feet are hidden but when you remove that then the clay feet are 
revealed. So the clay feet are their neurological problems, their problems of trying to quit something or their anger issues or whatever. So it could be a chance that this particular whole segment of population is simply conditioned by the issues which are faced by society today. And they are projecting their thoughts on the screen of religion and spirituality. Religion doesn't entertain those questions. So they move on to the vast uncharted area of spirituality. Mm. And uh, chances are they might not get an answer even there. So what could be a what would be a guiding principle for someone who, as I say in today's language, burned their fingers or burned their lips with religion? We have in India a very popular saying that one whose lips are charred because of hot milk, then even uh, takes, takes buttermilk, a glass of buttermilk with extra caution. You heard that saying? Yes. Yeah. One, I think in English it's put as like once burned, twice shy. Yeah. That's our appro approximation of that same principle. So, yes, in one sense, uh, the, the suspicion or hesitation or aversion to religion is not so much because irreligious or atheistic life is so attractive. It is because people have had negative experiences with whatever religion they found in their sociocultural environment. And that those negative experiences often came because religious practitioners and religious teachers sometimes were far from exhibiting the kind of virtues that were taught in their traditions also. So one point which I felt is vital is that we need to connect with people first at a human level before we can connect with them at a spiritual level mm -hmm. or at a religious level. One of the things which uh, the contemporary generation at one sense, in one sense values enormously and at the same time uh, uh, loses very easily is relationships. Oh yes. Yeah. In one sense everybody needs and seeks relationships. But at the same time you know, this amount of anxiety and despair and uh, agony and even uh, suicidal thought that come associated with trauma so in relationships show that one level people are heavily invested in, in relationships in the sense that they want it but at the same time things don't work out because of various factors so if if rather than there rather than talking about beliefs and behaviors this is what we believe. This is or rather beliefs and not, I would say, behaviors. I would say beliefs and rituals. You know, this is what we believe and this is what we do as a part of religious tradition. If uh, the focus could be more on connecting with each other at a human level, so that would be seen as pr through practical, practical cultured conduct. Prabhupada would say that my followers are perfect gentlemen and ladies. So if a good courteous behavior is seen and through that is based not just as a show like marketing but it is based on a foundation of sound values then even people who are otherwise burned by religion by by their negative experiences they can also be attracted because ultimately they do want relationships can i move on to the next point yes please so this is also, I think we both uh, have discussed sometimes in the past about, uh, we both know Father Baron, who mm. talks of rather than giving spirituality to those who are not part of your flock, you can concentrate on those who were with you and have chosen not to be with you. And this also makes sound business sense rather than gaining new customers. If you find out why old customers are not buying from you, that is a much more saner business proposal. So I'm just comparing sometimes what makes sense 
or religion or spirituality may not make sense with hardcore uh, materialist people. But this, this principle is also emphasized by those who have nothing to do with religion. But they say it costs four times as much money to get a new customer than to retain somebody who was with you but has been disgruntled because of poor service or whatever. So in the Western scene, people have left the religion or sect in which they were born for one big reason, that is they feel religionists are very judgmental. And the Western topics are LGBTQ rights, rights of immigrants, uh, many other social issues. Mm. In India, it could be caste and community-based interests or somebody could be seen talking about the equality of everyone, but in their private behavior, they might choose to um, favor a particular caste or a community. So most of this group of between 18 and 40 say that we don't want anything to do with this kind of hypocrisy. Yes. Yeah, this is, uh, again, I, I mean, it is so true, ter so hugely true. And again, I think this comes back to the point that sometimes within religious traditions, the emphasis on dogmas and rituals becomes so high that that becomes a filter through which everything is seen. Or that becomes the only filter through which everything is seen. And therefore, anybody who doesn't uh, conform, who doesn't seem to harmonize with that, that person is immediately not only rejected, but even, even condemned, as you said, judged. So from a, I, my understanding, the Bhagavad Gita actually talks about three modes of material nature. And these three modes, in one sense, have nothing to do intrinsically with, with one's faith in a particular deity or a faith in a particular path. The modes are largely behavioral characteristics. Of course, we can say that if there is devotion, if there is a spiritual inclination, a spiritual kind of commitment, naturally one will be more in the mode of goodness. But overall, the Bhagavad Gita talks about the mode of goodness in terms of characteristics that are not intrinsically spiritual. They are more behavioral, cognitional, and uh, psychological than spiritual. So the idea is that the Bhagavad Gita acknowledges the point that good people uh, that characteristics of goodness are something which is to be valued. And sometimes when we become too judgmental because of our religious practices, then we may think we are being transcendental, but we may come off as somebody so narrow-minded that people may think we are in the mode of passion or ignorance. So if we, for example, use our religious tradition, philosophy or practices to bash other religious traditions, and people may say, this is just the same competitive mentality I see in the mundane world. So where is the broad-mindedness? Where is the tolerance? And they may think, they may not even know the modes, goodness, passion, or ignorance. But our behavior may come out as passionate to them. So if we are distributing books and we say, we somehow or other trying to opportunistically uh, get something, give a book to them and take something from people, then they may not see any spirituality in our conduct. Although there is spirituality in the content of the book we are giving. So I would say that judgmentality which you talked about, it, it, uh, if we see people as nothing but somehow, uh, you could say, uninformed targets of conversion. And if they are not ready to be converted, then they are to be condemned then it becomes a problem. Now, I'm not saying that we do it all the time, but religious traditions in general have been guilty of that. So it is very easy to become judgmental and it is quite alienating. I'm sure you must also have had experiences of the judgmentality. Oh, yes. In fact, it's interesting that you brought up this topic of the three modes. That is such a, a fundamental way of looking at things. And you rightly said that uh, it doesn't, what did you say? It doesn't talk about your relationship with the deity, but more about your behavior. 
Yes. That, Doesn't talk about commitment to a particular faith conception. Yes. Bhakti is used in such a broad way in uh, almost uh, all of Swami Prabhupada's, uh, Shri Prabhupada's books or conversations. And I was at the same time pleasantly, at the same time a bit worried when I read Lord Kapila actually analyzes even bhakti in the three modes. <laughs> yes. So from day one, I was under the assumption that all the bhakti I am doing is transcendental. And when I read those verses, which, which comes, which are the part of uh, <clears throat> Lord Kapila's teachings to his mother Devahuti, it is very clear there can be bhakti in the mode of ignorance. There can be bhakti mm. in the mode of passion, and there can be the bhakti in the mode of goodness, and also the highest point of bhakti in, in pure goodness. So, yes, this holier than thou attitude is something which people get put off, and then they wonder that, uh, like, the most worrisome part is organized religion doesn't so much introspect. And when people don't come, they in fact criticize the customer for not buying their goods. I love the way you're phrasing this. <laughs> yeah, people are so fallen. People are so degraded. That's that's a that's a definitely a problem, big problem. So we move on to another significant point. What so was just, just your thought? Yeah. So how do we avoid the judgmentality? As I mentioned, one thing is that we connect with people at a human level, exhibit good behavior, uh, exhibit behavior that is appealing by normal social standards also. Not standards of sensuality, but basically expectation of what is a decent behavior. That, that's one way to avoid. Another point I thought is that, you know, it's important to recognize that we can't judge people by standards that they haven't accepted. So mm. if I say somebody is such a terrible person because they are eating cow flesh, so they, they don't even know there's anything wrong with eating eating any kind of meat, leave alone, leave alone the meat of a cow. So if we demean if we could, so if we demean people for standards that they haven't accepted, then it becomes a big problem. So I would say that we have to put it to some extent, we cannot impose our standards on others, those especially those are not accepted those standards also. So that understanding is important. In the business world, what they say is, if you feel as a boss, your telephone system, I'm giving an old example, where your secretary or the receptionist, they give reasonably good service. One simple thing is to make an anonymous call yourself. <laughs> so when you call your own company and then they make you either wait or they are insulting or whatever, then you come to know this is how they would be treating the average person. So similarly, in the army, they say the top brass, they should eat the food which is cooked for the, the, the basic level soldier. And... Uh, of course, there is a this kind of a joke in the Air Force. Uh, a good friend of mine shared that there would be a day when some top brass would do this service. They, they, they take this service by turns. Like if there are four commanding officers, they could be told to go once a month and check out what food is being served to the whole in the whole mess. They have their officers mess, but this time they come and eat with the rank and file soldiers. But that day is known in advance. So the kitchen <laughs> takes special precautions that, you know. <laughs> oh, God. So, so it's like in a school, so that, sometimes there's an inspection committee that is going to come. And the school is already spick and span because exactly, everything is... Okay. Exactly. So if, like, I am a so-called office bearer in a temple. And if I come in the ordinary line for taking prasad, and then I know who are the people, who are the volunteers who are serving, what kind of language is used, what kind of atmosphere is there, whether it's a welcoming atmosphere or not. So this is 
what is meant by introspection. It is not like, it is not rocket science. And once you come to know that even if four out of thousand people have been treated like that, like they say, we have the six sigma level. They say, no, this is not accepted. We need to do some change. And as what you is said, it? six sigma? Six sigma is a quality control test. Okay. So let's say six out of 10,000 cases, like six products out of 10,000 such products, that is the limit of them being defective. One okay. more and the whole lot is rejected. So uh, regarding how queries are answered, how people are felt uh, welcome in your premises or how their questions are uh, dealt with. This becomes that exercise of trying to improve our relationships. And once somebody has seen that this particular place or this person has invested in relationships authentically, not as a show or something, then I am. I, can I hazard to say that every business has failures, every service has its faults. Like not all airlines give you top-notch service. Sometimes they may misplace your baggage. Sometimes they may they may be six hours late or whatever. But let's say that, like I was once going on a flight, it said instead of 10.30, it's going to be 11.45. Then it became 12.45, mm. then 1.45, then 2.30. Finally, at 3.30, the plane actually left. Mm. But throughout the time, they were exceptionally kind of good. And uh, the staff there was cheerful. They gave fruits. Then they gave some chips and then they offered something else and offered something else. So every time they had to move the clock one hour ahead, they said, ladies and gentlemen, things are really beyond our control. There is one part is needed, which is very important for the aircraft's safety and we cannot compromise on airline safety standards, therefore the delay. So what was happening was people were cursing for them not having that particular part but some of them started saying that, hey, if that part is so important, then it is good that the plane is delayed. I wouldn't want something to happen mid-air and they say that, okay, brace for uh, landing in the water or whatever, something like that. So, of course, mm. hoping that that part, short, that part was not there was a real thing. But the main point is uh, lacunae, uh, not coming up with the standards, all these are part of a community or community organization. Like somebody asks a real technical question about the universe. And like one, one devotee, he was in preaching in Switzerland. So one man came to him and asked a very challenging question. And he said, look, why don't you come to this place on a weekend and over a nice glass of fruit juice, that particular fruit grows uh, in a great quantity over in that area. So why don't we just discuss as friends? Now, this, this, this one instance of someone reaching out to someone's heart, mm. pacified that person. Not that his technical query about the universe was immediately solved. But he got the feeling that here is someone who is interested in me. So this is what, uh, of course, as you rightly said, we cannot oversimplify complex issues. So winning over people's heart is also not just giving them free fruit juice or free cookies or whatever. <laughs> that also, if it's not done with authentic authenticity, it may come out as outright a public relations disaster. But the fact is that uh, today's social media boom is a glaring piece of evidence that people are looking for connections and Facebook is giving them but sad to say that Facebook research from one Harvard research group kind of revealed that Facebook also lands you in serious loneliness yes so religion and spirituality which is supposed to give you thick heart 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 to heart connections you heard the the letters BFF, 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking about that. Now you may say that uh, I'm 55 today. I don't use these things, these words to anyone. He is my BFF, best friend forever. <laughs> yes. So I was just thinking, does society or the wisdom around floating around society does it empower this 18 to 40 year old as to what best actually means? Is he or she clear about the gamut of emotions which are available to make something best? They say friend in need is a friend indeed. So how many times the need has been seen? The need is only for money, for some connections, or for sense gratification parties. How, how do you define best? And even more challenging is how do you define forever? For people today, forever could be six months, six weeks, six days. Six hours. Oh, he was my best friend forever for six hours. You know, this, this shows the... <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the point you are making through this example is that that there is a there is a desperate need for connections. Yes. And uh, so, so overall our podcast is going toward that direction that whatever be the preconceptions that the contemporary mind may bring in its uh, approach towards religion or because of which it may not even approach religion, uh, the way if we as a representative of the Bhakti tradition are trying to address them, the way would be to try to develop a human connection, to try to develop relationships. One of the key ways, I would say, and not the only way, but one of the key ways. So I come to the last major point that is what are the outlets, what are the ways in which people who are attracted more to spirituality express themselves? Mm. A is B. Can I just wait one minute? Yeah, sure. I make one point. There is this whole in the Western world also, especially in Christianity, there's a lot of discussion about how Christianity is decreasing a lot in the Western world. It's increasing in say, in India and Africa and other places. But the, so one of the reasons they say is that we are the too dogmatic, too ritualistic. But then what some, that's the view that the liberals have. But the conservatives say that even the liberal churches are emptying. That not that liberal churches are flourishing. So what they also say is that if, if the church simply becomes a place where it just becomes like another place for socialization. Then people feel that we have other places. We don't have to come to a church. Mm -hmm. so, so we also have to offer something distinctive that, that people will not find somewhere else. And that ultimately, that's of course, we want to offer also, no doubt about it. But in, I think that in developing relationships, at one level, the fact that our... We, if again to use, commer use uh, commercial terminology, our USP is that we can offer a relationship with a personal loving deity. So that shouldn't be so downplayed that it is lost. And uh, so the, I earlier talked about the dogmas and the rituals. Now the very word dogmas and rituals have a negative connotation with, to them. But you know, there are practices and there are principles. We could use more or uh, there are philosophical tenets, there are, uh, there are, there are uh, truths shared by the wisdom texts, whatever words you want to use, but those also need to be presented at the, in the appropriate way at the appropriate time. Otherwise, we just, uh, we are nothing different to offer. So in one sense, there is something which people seek and need, and there is something which people need, but they are no longer seeking. So most people may not be seeking Krishna right now, but uh, they also need Krishna. So in one sense, we need we may have to make sure that we provide pe provide people what they need, so that what what they currently need, so that ultimately we can help help them to gain what they eternally or ultimately need, and. Providing them what they presently need doesn't mean we have to go out of the ambit of Krishna consciousness. Not that we have to do something, we don't have to start a, a, a sports club in a spiritual center. We don't have to have an entertainment center in the spiritual center. But 
just like basic human relationships or basic human courtesies and warm relationships they are actually we could say in they should be natural outgrowths of our own spirituality and our bhakti yes yeah yes so can i go on to this next point please <laughs> so two basic uh, broad categories which are the favorite sort of hanging out places of uh, this particular segment of the population is get out of your home be alone with nature explore nature and so then that gave a rise of trekking and trail walking and uh, like so many things i was surprised to see there is something called forest bath it doesn't mean taking a bath in the forest but being in a forest and trying to absorb the sight sound smell being aware so uh, the second category is art music singing painting journaling creative writing so these are the favorite haunts of uh, this segment and i would dare say that anyone trying to reach out to them would uh, risk a big hazard if they don't have something to offer this group by using their spiritual wisdom so the first question could be that can we seek out krishna in nature yes certainly i mean the whole eight chapter ten chapter is about krishna in nature isn't it in many ways so uh nature is also brings us closer to sattva guna and sattva guna also makes us more the mode of goodness that makes us more receptive to spirituality and uh, in one sense if i go back uh, to your earlier points what you said about judgmental or too close minded too predetermined like a trajectory this is where you have to go this is how you have to go so if somebody is looking for higher experiences uh, nature offers one some higher experiences without making any preconditions you know you have to believe this you have to follow this nothing just come explore observe and uh, nature can just by observing nature and re- re- reflecting thereby one can get many higher experiences at least higher than what are offered in the normal sense conduct of life so this can go up to up to a certain level where nature itself becomes like a deity for people but yeah i say nature and uh, whether it is environmental consciousness or just nature walks and things like that they can be a good segue to help people perceive of a higher reality and thus connect with krishna or it could also be a segue a means by which if devotees are doing these things providing these things we connect with people and bond with them at a level where they are receptive for something higher so that would be my thoughts what are your thoughts about this yeah exactly uh, when i read uh, propa's life uh, story initially propa did not insist on people playing just one particular instrument in fact in second avenue he said you bring whatever you have and the whole atmosphere was the swami like a kind father he didn't change his uh, rituals or whatever he would perform his mangalacharan with bells and very soon the young crowd started calling that ceremony simply bells that the, <laughs> okay that the, i know that that the, that the swami comes and sits and for 7 8 minutes he just does some ceremony he doesn't insist the audience to participate in fact after that start singing and then when when he starts speaking people leave so he could immediately understand that these people are so much averse to someone telling them what to do so while watching the archana ceremony there is no force while singing it is perceived as i'm just participating in a musical concert but when one mm. starts speaking and 20 starts listening they feel this is some somebody being judgmental somebody saying this is good therefore this is bad i am saying this therefore you should do that 
So very deftly, with a lot of creative vision, the Swami, it is not like there was a team of Swamis who would cooperate together. There was just one person, 70 years old, and about 20, 25 youngsters, mostly below 30. And when the atmosphere was, don't trust anyone about 30, Srila Prabhupada convincingly turned the tide in his favor by just becoming the, uh, the wise father, the compassionate father, the generous father. Everything what they wanted for in a relationship they could find with him. And therefore, majority of them, those who took up the process seriously, almost none of them say that uh, my intellectual questions were satisfied, therefore I continued. I had a relationship with the Swami and that drew me slowly, slowly, slowly inside the process. Once I liked the person, I started liking the philosophy also. Mm, very important point. So, at one level, Prabhupada, as you said, Prabhupada did talk about, if you go back to the dogmas and rituals, let's not use those words, because philosophy and the practices, mm. Prabhupada did not deny or neglect them. Like he did the Mangalachan rituals. He also spoke philosophy. He did talk about our essential spiritual identity. But that was not the primary thing that attracted them. Of course, the Kirtans attracted them to some extent. But it was a personal bond. So the Prabhupada is an excellent example in one sense of making sure that the, the human connection doesn't come in the is not impeded by. So we preserve the you could say almost the sanctity, but how people perceive sanctity of human connections or relationships. At the same time, we preserve also the sanctity of our traditions, uh, philosophy, and practices, both. So we don't let one take over the other. Yes, you know, just, so that just is going, on to, another, going on to one point which you mentioned about yeah. creative journaling and writing and yes. creative writing and journaling. It's one thought I read uh, somewhere that basically uh, I read this in a book by a Christian historian about why is this, what's wrong with Christianity. So he says today's people are more, much more interested in understanding the divinity of the self rather than the demands of a jealous God. Oh. <laughs> so now divinity of the self, I wondered whether that itself refers to that I am God, but not necessarily that I am God. It is just we are all parts of the divine. It could refer to that also. But all these uh, journaling or creative writing or poetry, at one level, we could just see them as self-indulgence. But another level, we could see them as attempts for self-understanding. And uh, so in one sense, even people who are doing all this, they are not just interested in money and gross sensuality. It may, they may still be interested in that, those things. They may not be giving up those things. But that's not all that obsesses their minds. They are looking for deeper self-understanding. And of course, they may not understand the self up to the level of the Atma, but they are looking deeper. Okay, what? Am, who am I really? What is what? What is it that will give me fulfillment in my life? So, so all these can be gradually channeled toward toward spiritual understanding. So we could say self-understanding is what is being self-expression, self-understanding. That is what is being sought over here. And in my own small way, I've tried to present journaling as a integrate journaling with Gita wisdom. And I find that it does resonate with many people who otherwise feel that, okay, all that I do over here is, even in, among those who are trying to practice bhakti, all that I do is I just chant these mantras and I attend these classes and I do these services. But am I gaining self-understanding? Am I actually being transformed? So they feel they often treat journaling almost like a spiritual practice. And if we take a very inclusive understanding of spirituality, as anything that takes us closer to our spiritual essence, then all these activities, they are taking people towards uh, closer, to a closer to their spiritual essence. 
I think when you talk about nature walks, going back earlier, I think uh, was it Thoreau who wrote that Walden when he was on the in a forest, and they are very deeply introspective discussions. So introspective reflection, not discussions. Yeah. And they are considered classic in their tradition. So I feel that if we can, we can. There is a lot of lot of avenues where bhakti spirituality can connect with the contemporary mind. If we just uh, learn to do a, we could say, a, we just seek to understand them before, uh, before, before condemning them for not understanding us. So that completes, uh, yeah, almost completes my point. You want to add something? You'd like to summarize? Yeah, I'll try to summarize. At least, sir, today we discussed about you now how. how is bhakti spirituality relevant for the contemporary mind and then started by talking about how you know each generation has almost like its own language and unless things are communicated in that language things don't make sense to them or even what they are doing doesn't make sense to us if we don't understand their language so then you started talking about the characteristics of the contemporary mind so one of the things uh, we started with that they say religion as very rigid and predictable with mm. no sense of exploration or adventure so this is the place take this map and go to the museum there is i just want to go on a walk and uh, if i find the ex- museum excellent but i want to discover explore so spirituality bhakti spirituality also does provide that facility for exploring in the sense that although a path is given and although the destination is told but going on that journey is a individual experience individual discovery so it's so we have to present the desirability of the destination and the feasibility of the path if you don't do that and just tell this is the, this is what you should do then not be attracted so i talked about two extremes one is that you know, we just keep going round and round at the bottom of the mountain and never go up and the other is we just tell this is the only way up the mountain and don't even think about anything else but instead of that it they explain that okay this is why is this what is if we extend the two things then we can attract people there is no doubt about that then another point which you mentioned is that about uh, there's uh, judgmentality a lot and judgmentality comes because we are quite we judge everyone based on our dogma uh, the religious tradition based judge people based on their dogmas and their their rituals and in one sense it's unfair to judge people according to the standards that they haven't accepted so instead if we try to connect at a human level and then we can uh, that the relationships are desperate thought like people and through that we can actually help people grow and one more thing was op- in the part of discovery is not just discovery of what i do but also discovery in terms of can i ask any kind of questions Yeah. So that point which you mentioned about, so if we, rather than just uh, judging the question itself as inappropriate, we see that we see our answer to the question not as an opportunity to simply, uh, what should we say, condemn the questioner, but to connect with the questioner. Then we can we can address that inquisitive spirit. And our tradition has Brahma Jigyasa as its cardinal as a starting point of spirituality. Inquire. about the ultimate reality so the the exploring spirit the questioning spirit the non judgmental expectations so so we can meet them if we focus on a human connection and then we discussed about while all this we shouldn't forget that we have something more to offer otherwise we just become a part of the social another social club and then lastly you talked about the creative the exploration of nature so nature can be a non non demanding way to experience something higher and then from that experience of something higher some some people can be guided further higher toward krishna through friendships through sharing spiritual insight based on nature whatever and then lastly you talk about creative expression so so this creative expression can be seen as self indulgence negatively but it can be also seen as self exploration self expression and the self is a part of the divine so if that can be channeled cons- creatively then there are all these whatever are the current areas of interest of the contemporary mind they all can be 
they all can be channeled in a spirit devotional direction if bhakti spirituality is understood and presented appropriately any concluding thoughts very nicely thank you very much it's a wonderful topic and a very stimulating discussion hare krishna hare krishna